Having left Lestrade at his rooms, we drove to our hotel where we found lunch upon the table. Holmes was silent and buried in thought with a pained expression upon his face, as one who finds himself in a perplexing position. "'Look here, Watson,' he said when the cloth was cleared. "'Just sit down in this chair, and let me preach to you for a little. I don't know quite what to do, and I should value your advice. Light a cigar, and let me expound.' "'And pray do so.' "'Well, now, in considering this case, there are two points about young McCarthy's narrative which struck us both instantly, although they impressed me in his favour and you against him. One was the fact that his father should, according to his account, cry cooee before seeing him. The other was his singular dying reference to a rat. He mumbled several words, you understand, but that was all that caught the son's ear. Now, from this double point our research must commence, and we will begin it by presuming that what the lad says is absolutely true. What of this cooey, then? Well, obviously it could not have been meant for the son. The son, as far as he knew, was in Bristol. It was mere chance that he was within earshot. The cooey was meant to attract the attention of whoever it was that he had the appointment with. But cooey is a distinctly Australian cry, and one which is used between Australians. There is a strong presumption that the person whom McCarthy expected to meet him at Boscombe Pool was someone who had been in Australia. What of the rat, then? Sherlock Holmes took a folded paper from his pocket and flattened it out on the table. This is a map of the colony of Victoria, he said. I wired to Bristol for it last night. He put his hand over part of the map. What do you read? A rat, I read. And now? He raised his hand. Ballarat. Quite so. That was the word the man uttered, and of which his son only caught the last two syllables. He was trying to utter the name of his murderer, so-and-so of Ballarat. It is wonderful! I exclaimed. It is obvious. And now, you see, I had narrowed the field down considerably. The possession of a grey garment was a third point which, granting the son's statement to be correct, was a certainty. We have come now out of mere vagueness to the definite conception of an Australian from Ballarat with a grey cloak. Certainly. And one who was at home in the district, for the pool can only be approached by the farm or by the estate, where strangers could hardly wander. Quite so. Then comes our expedition of today. By an examination of the ground I gained the trifling details which I gave to that imbecile Lestrade as to the personality of the criminal. But how did you gain them? You know my method. It is founded upon the observation of trifles. His height, I know that you might roughly judge from the length of his stride. His boots, too, might be told from their traces. Yes, they were peculiar boots. But his lameness? The impression of his right foot was always less distinct than his left. He put less weight upon it. Why? Because he limped. He was lame. But his left-handedness. You were yourself struck by the nature of the injury as recorded by the surgeon at the inquest. The blow was struck from immediately behind and yet was upon the left side. Now, how can that be, unless it were by a left-handed man? He had stood behind that tree during the interview between the father and son. He had even smoked there. I found the ash of a cigar, which my special knowledge of tobacco ashes enabled me to pronounce as an Indian cigar. I have, as you know, devoted some attention to this and written a little monograph on the ashes of a hundred and forty different varieties of pipe, cigar, and cigarette tobacco. Having found the ash, I then looked round and discovered the stump among the moss where he had tossed it. It was an Indian cigar of the variety which are rolled in Rotterdam. And the cigar holder? I could see that the end had not been in his mouth. Therefore, he used a holder. The tip had been cut off, not bitten off, but the cut was not a clean one, so I deduced a blunt penknife. Holmes, I said. You have drawn a net round this man from which he cannot escape, 
and you have saved an innocent human life as truly as if you had cut the cord which was hanging him. I see the direction in which all this points. The culprit is— Mr. John Turner, cried the hotel waiter, opening the door of our sitting-room and ushering in a visitor. The man who entered was a strange and impressive figure. His slow, limping step and bowed shoulders gave the appearance of decrepitude, and yet his hard, deep-lined, craggy features and his enormous limbs showed that he was possessed of unusual strength of body and of character. His tangled beard, grizzled hair, and outstanding drooping eyebrows combined to give an air of dignity and power to his appearance. But his face was of an ashen white, while his lips and the corners of his nostrils were tinged with a shade of blue. It was clear to me at a glance that he was in the grip of some deadly and chronic disease. "'Pray, sit down on the sofa,' said Holmes gently. "'You had my note?' "'Yes. The lodge-keeper brought it up. You said that you wished to see me here to avoid scandal.' "'I thought people would talk if I went to the hall.' "'And why do you wish to see me?' He looked across at my companion with despair in his weary eyes, as though his question was already answered. "'Yes,' said Holmes, answering the look rather than the words. "'It is so. I know all about McCarthy.' The old man sank his face in his hands. "'God help me!' he cried. "'But I would not have let the young man come to harm.' I give you my word that I would have spoken out if it went against him at the Assizes. I am glad to hear you say so, said Holmes, gravely. I would have spoken now had it not been for my dear girl. It would break her heart. It'll break her heart when she hears that I'm arrested. It may not come to that, said Holmes. What? I am no official agent. I understand that it was your daughter who required my presence here, and I am acting in her interests. Young McCarthy must be got off, however. "'I am a dying man,' said old Turner. "'I have had diabetes for years. My doctor says it's a question of whether I shall live a month. Yet I would rather die under my own roof than in a jail.' Holmes rose and sat down at the table with his pen in his hand and a bundle of paper before him. "'Just tell us the truth,' he said. "'I shall jot down the facts. You will sign it, and Watson here can witness it.' Then I could produce your confession at the last extremity to save young McCarthy. I promise you that I shall not use it unless it is absolutely needed. It's as well, said the old man. It's a question whether I shall live till the assizes, so it matters little to me. But I should wish to spare Alice the shock. And now I'll make the thing clear to you. It has been a long time in the acting, but will not take me long to tell. You didn't know this dead man, McCarthy. He was a devil incarnate, I'll tell you that. God keep you out of the clutches of such a man as he. His grip has been upon me these twenty years, and he has blasted my life. I'll tell you first how I came to be in his power. It was in the early sixties at the diggings. I was a young chap then, hot-blooded and reckless ready to turn my hand at anything. I got among bad companions, took to drink, had no luck with my claim, took to the bush, and in a word became what you would call over here a highway robber. There were six of us, and we had a wild, free life of it, sticking up a station from time to time, or stopping the wagons on the road to the diggings. Black Jack of Ballarat was the name I went under, and our party is still remembered in the colony as the Ballarat Gang. One day, a gold convoy came down from Ballarat to Melbourne. We lay in wait for it and attacked it. There were six troopers and six of us, so it was a close thing, but we emptied four of their saddles at the first volley. Three of our boys were killed, however, before we got the swag. I put my pistol to the head of the wagon driver, who was this very man McCarthy. I wish to the Lord that I had shot him then, but I spared him, though I saw his wicked little eyes fixed on my face as though to remember every feature. We got away with the gold, became wealthy men, 
and made our way over to England without being suspected. There I parted from my old pals and determined to settle down to a quiet and respectable life. I bought this estate, which chanced to be in the market, and I set myself to do a little good with my money to make up for the way in which I had earned it. I married, too, and though my wife died young, she left me my dear little Alice. Even when she was just a baby, her wee hand seemed to lead me down the right path as nothing else had ever done. In a word, I turned over a new leaf and did my best to make up for the past. All was going well when McCarthy laid his grip upon me. I had gone up to town about an investment, and I met him in Regent Street with hardly a coat to his back or a boot to his foot. "'Here we are, Jack,' says he, touching me on the arm. "'We'll be as good as a family to you. There's two of us, me and my son, and you can have the keeping of us. If you don't, it's a fine law-abiding country as England. There's always a policeman within hail.' Well, down they came to the West Country. There was no shaking them off, and there they have lived rent-free on my best land ever since. There was no rest for me, no peace, no forgetfulness. Turn where I would, there was his cunning, grinning face at my elbow. It grew worse as Alice grew up, for he soon saw I was more afraid of her knowing my past than of the police. Whatever he wanted he must have and whatever it was I gave him without question, land, money, houses, until at last he asked a thing which I could not give. He asked for Alice. His son, you see, had grown up, so had my girl, and as I was known to be in weak health, it seemed a fine stroke to him that his lad should step into the whole property. But there I was firm. I would not have his cursed stock mixed with mine, not that I had any dislike to the lad, but his blood was in him, and that was enough. I stood firm. McCarthy threatened. I braved him to do his worst. We were to meet at the pool midway between our houses to talk it over. When I went down there, I found him talking with his son, so I smoked a cigar and waited behind a tree until he should be alone. But as I listened to his talk, all that was black and bitter in me seemed to come uppermost. He was urging his son to marry my daughter with as little regard for what she might think as if she were a slut from off the streets. It drove me mad to think that I and all that I held most dear should be in the power of such a man as this. Could I not snap the bond? I was already a dying and a desperate man, though clear of mind and fairly strong of limb. I knew that my own fate was sealed, but my memory and my girl— both could be saved if I could but silence that foul tongue. I did it, Mr. Holmes. I would do it again. Deeply as I have sinned, I have led a life of martyrdom to atone for it, but that my girl should be entangled in the same meshes which held me was more than I could suffer. I struck him down with no more compunction than if he had been some foul and venomous beast. His cry brought back his son, but I had gained the cover of the wood, though I was forced to go back to fetch the cloak which I had dropped in my flight. That's the true story, gentlemen, of all that occurred. Well, it's not for me to judge you, said Holmes, as the old man signed the statement which had been drawn out. I pray that we may never be exposed to such a temptation. I pray not, sir. And what do you intend to do? In view of your health? Nothing. You are yourself aware that you will soon have to answer for your deed at a higher court than the Assizes. I will keep your confession, and if McCarthy is condemned, I shall be forced to use it. If not, it shall never be seen by mortal eye, and your secret, whether you be alive or dead, shall be safe with us. Farewell, then, said the old man solemnly. Your own deathbeds, when they come— will be the easier for the thought of the peace which you have given to mine. Tottering and shaking in all his giant frame, he stumbled slowly from the room. "'God help us,' said Holmes, after a long silence. "'Why does fate play such tricks with poor helpless worms? I never hear of such a case as this 
that I do not think of Baxter's words and say, There but for the grace of God goes Sherlock Holmes. James McCarthy was acquitted at the Assizes on the strength of a number of objections which had been drawn out by Holmes and submitted to the defending counsel. Old Turner lived for seven months after our interview, but he is now dead and there is every prospect that the son and daughter may come to live happily together in ignorance of the black cloud which rests upon their past. 